just keep her through cars and a wishing well. Prayed for a love to call us own, a love to break the spell. Welcome to the Red Pill Buddhas podcast for red pilled Buddhas everywhere. Revolutionary, free thinking spiritual people who've woken up from the mainstream narrative on various levels. And I interview some of the most fascinating ones here. Please also visit thehumanunleashed.com for hundreds of hours of our video content on all areas of health, lifestyle, and much more. And the redpillrevolution.com for our five star reviewed book and subsequent publications in the Red Pill series as they come out. Right, welcome back everybody to my new Red Pill Buddhas podcast and I'm excited today because I have the great honor of having snagged Isaac Shapiro for a, for a chat. Now, I think that some of my audience are not kind of non-dual and spiritual fans, but very open-minded and for those who don't know, Isaac is a, is a very well-known spiritual teacher from the lineage of uh, Ramana Maharshi and uh, HWL is it Punja who's more more commonly known as yeah. and uh, and Isaac has some wonderful wonderful videos out there and I've, I've listened to his stuff for many years found it very inspiring but uh, today I mean I, I would I would love to delve into because I'm fascinated with stories I'd love to delve into all the time that you spent with Papaji and all that kind of thing but to be honest at the moment with the huge misconceptions in the world about so many things. I wondered if we could actually dive into some of the misconceptions about what people call enlightenment or awakening or whatever. And maybe because to explain what it is, 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 is really like catching a very greasy thing with extra grease on. So it might be fun, I think, to, to explore what it isn't, but also maybe to look into some of the present situation because I think um, what I've admired so much about Isaac and how I came to know him when we both got our interviews banned from Buddha at the gas pump by our, our friend Rick Archer and, um, and and so I you know every cloud has a silver lining so I got to meet uh, I got to meet Isaac by being in the in the back gap naughty boys club and that's been great so um, Isaac welcome and thank you so much for doing this. Oh man, such a pleasure. I've really enjoyed getting to talk to you to the couple of times you've spoken. And, you know, I just wanted to correct a couple of things you said, because firstly, right. from my perspective, I'm not a teacher. And um, but also in both Papaji and Ramana never, had, never considered that there was such a thing as a lineage. So, um, no, yes, this is you know, I, expressions that people use, but yeah, I totally yeah, no, yeah, just because it, 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 you know, it, it, um, it promotes an idea that isn't helpful as far as I can see. You know, to me, how I, I see it, it's just when I'm with people, I point them at their own knowing by asking questions, because what they know doesn't maybe benefits them, but what I know doesn't help anybody. So that, you know, I'm not trying to teach anyone, I'm just asking questions that, I, that have developed over the years that point people to see for themselves. And, and I love You know, that. it's like this, this. So I love one of your, one of the things that I heard you say about how it's just a finger pointing at me, and Papaji had said, but every finger is crooked. I love this. Man. Yeah, so don't look at the finger. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> look where it's pointing, yeah. yeah. No, so, I mean, you know, let's just, you know, when we speak about non-dual, let's just, let me give like a few sentences just to get people on the same page, so to speak. And just... I invite everyone just to see if what I'm saying resonates with your own knowing. So in this moment, just right here, I mean, all that anybody ever has is this moment. doesn't matter whether you're a billionaire or anything. What we have is this moment. And in this moment, we perceive what we call the universe through our senses. 
And so what that means is that this moment is a sensation or we could say information that usually gets interpreted through our conditioning and our trauma load. And we end up with the perception. And because we used to it, we tend to think of that perception as reality. But in fact, it's an interpretation. Another way of saying the same thing is it's a waking dream. So, and it's the same with what we call our bodying activity. The, um, this bodying activity, how do we know it's there? We sense it also. So, and just check that. Just how do you know that there's a bodying activity going on? You see it, you, maybe you smell it, or you can touch it and feel it, or you hear a heartbeat or something. I mean, it's just all information coming through the senses. So then the deep question is, what is, or, you know, there's, there's obviously awareness of all those sensations, and that awareness is colorless. You cannot say what it is. It's beyond the senses. But without that awareness being there, there is no sensing. It's like if you sh show a movie onto a screen, you see the movie, but if there's no screen, <laughs> you don't see anything. So in, it's a, it's a, in a way, it's a poor analogy, but it's the same thing. There's awareness in this moment of both the sensations and when it starts getting a little finer, the interpretation that, that's happening. So if anything I'm saying sounds like a teaching, to me, it's just like, uh, like I said, it's just inviting people to see if this resonates with their own knowing. That's all. So in this moment, there's sensations, there's the interpretation going on, and that interpretation has been conditioned. And that conditioning started from conception and, and we even carry information we know from all many uh, layers of ancestry back. So, you know, a lot of it, there's nothing, there's no association with it. It's so, we're so used to it, it just colors everything without ever being aware of it. So we can say there's awareness and then there's the sensations and then the interpretations that we call experience. It is a, the, the, yeah. a very subtle thing to see through that veil, isn't it? And, and one of the images yeah. that has always um, um, resonated with me that I, I use quite a bit is, is you know, one of those um, sort of puzzles, like a, a, a sort of load of blobs or whatever, as you look at it. And then if you go a little bit cross-eyed or look focus kind of beyond it, mm -hmm. you might see a picture suddenly appear yeah. in 3D. And once you've seen it, you can't exactly, it. exactly. It's very difficult to see it in the first yes. place. Exactly. And so now you've come to the third factor, which is our attention. What is attention? It's focus. So our focus of attention determines the sense of self that we have, the sense of the universe that we inhabit, the experience that we have. And for most of us, the habit of attention has been conditioned to see everything as objects. So we say a tree, but in actuality, that tree we are sensing and experiencing, and it's a verb, it's not a noun. But language turns everything into nouns. So like, you know, Philip would be a noun rather than a Philipping, you could say, because it's <laughs> what is Philip actually? This is constantly... You know, it's like ever-changing expression of totality, in fact. So when we used to looking through that, seeing everything as objects, it produces a sense of separation, which is the basis of fear and the basis of uh, duality, you could say. So a trick that I, or oh, when I say a trick, but an invitation that, opened up for me at one point was, for those of us that have eyes, our eyes are our stronger sense. And when we're born, a baby doesn't yet know how to focus. Their eyes are just holes that the light come in. The focusing that our eyes do usually focus on, on something 
rather than just being a hole, rather than just being holes that the light come in. And so if anyone wants to explore, just, just playing with that, just exploring, what happens if your eyes are just holes and you don't need to know what you're even looking at? That just the light can come in and just see what happens experientially. If somehow boundaries start to get less defined, somehow there's just a different sense of the moment. So it's, that's, it's that's kind lovely. of a quick and that's lovely. I had a I had a, a thing that I posted last year when everybody was very frightened of this supposed virus, and uh, it was called Corona Awakening: The Cure for Corona Fear or something. Some video, and it was something that seems to have made a lot of sense to me since. I had that sort of shift in about 2006 or so that th th there seems to be one of the exercises on uh, um, uh, with the headless way that seems to be very good. Of, yes. of, well, of just, yeah. you know, just sit there and see exactly where is the point that you end and everything else begins. And, and to it me, is, it was, yeah. I had, I had that book. I had um, um, Douglas Harding's on having no head. And I remember I had it when I was about 18 and I, I found it recently and it's just thumbed through, you know, I could understand all the other books yeah. like autobiography of the and this one, I knew there was something special in there, but I could not figure it out, you know, and now looking at it, it's like, Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's mm -hmm. such a beautiful thing. And I think, how, how, how do you think this would affect if, if, if more people had this perception, do you think any of this whole world situation would be possible now? Or do you think it's just unfolding as it should and that's fine? Or is it possible to have any real serious fear of that if you make this little shift? In the, so really when we talk about the shift, it's like a shift of attention and it's like, to try and put it into different words, because you know it's like when we say you make that shift, the, 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 there is no you that makes that shift. That's what's so weird. <laughs> I mean, I know you know that, but it's just because language. In my in my uh, misconceptions about enlightenment, my first one was that people actually get enlightened. That was my yeah. first misconception. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, one time I was interviewed, and they said to me, so when did you wake up? And I, you know, I'd never actually considered that question. And I, then I looked, I said, actually, you know, I never woke up. That which was awake was always awake. The sense of I never existed, so it couldn't wake up. So it's like a, a wrong question in a way, it, you know, it's like, so <laughs> it's like that, that, which is aware in this moment, who you are, you already are. It's not about changing something or getting somewhere. It's just like something gets seen and there's a recognition that this, this character that you've thought yourself to be or, or the doer just actually doesn't exist. And that life is doing its beautiful dance. And then of course the residues of, conditioning and trauma and all that stuff then start to unravel themselves but it's really nobody does it it's not this whole paradigm of working on yourself or there is no one to work on yourself it's just like there's that capacity of starting to recognize when you could say there's some resistance to the moment some uh, no it's just like oh wow I didn't even realize that was there I didn't know that the system was well, that great intelligence was functioning like that and in the seeing of it because it seems like no one would suffer consciously so to me that seems then all suffering is coming from unconscious activities and if we look at if something's happening automatically and unconsciously who's doing it clearly there's no one doing it but in that functioning a sense of me arises a sense of me happens it then claims doership <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah yeah, exactly. And if, if there is a point that in that sort of ego consciousness, you can you can uh, pinpoint a time where things change. One of the things about that moment is that it extends not only into the future, but in the past where you then yeah. see all of your all of your childhood and history as that as well, that it was there all the time. Yeah, that was how exactly. it was. 
But, um, yeah. you know, I've, I, I put a, f- a few things down here because I've, one thing I've always been fascinated with is, is finding out on that level, um, <laughs> on, on the sort of regular level um, that people uh, are normally aware of, um, what is nonsense and what isn't? And this is what I've loved about yeah, yeah. you, because at this time, I think it's very important to speak out if yeah. you have that desire to speak out. And people mm-hmm. are often saying, you know, if you mention it on any kind of a spiritual forum or Facebook group or something like that, people are saying, oh, no, you must just sit there. You must just, mm-hmm. you know, be, do all this meditation and stuff like that. And I think, you know, have they read their Gita where, you know, it's as, as our friend Rick's favorite expression is, you know, established in being take action. And it becomes that action mm-hmm. becomes not only more powerful, but it also becomes and less of a problem to the individual, you know, so that you don't get in a terrible state yeah. while you're while you're doing that action. So <clears throat> what do you think's happened in, in the spiritual community at the moment? Because some people are saying, oh, just do nothing. Is this is this sort of cowardice or have they not woken up to it? Or is this distilling out certain areas of the spiritual community where people to 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 use that silly phrase at the moment have had this awakening and are aware on this level or what what do you think is going on with it because i didn't expect there would be such a division in the spiritual community with this but there really is you know and people just aren't speaking Mm -hmm. out are they fooled are they thinking now i have to pretend to be this holy you know (laughs) and create and keep this persona what do you think is happening here yeah i think there's many layers to that that's and it's a fantastic inquiry it's like It's controversial to, you know, to speak, um, especially when there's such a strong mainstream media push that's presenting information as if it's fact. And then to say, listen, um, actually, <laughs> you know, I, it seems it's so amazing to me when I see from the get go, right from the get go, I knew that it was that this was uh, there was an agenda going on, um, and it seems like a number of people I've spoken to say the same thing. I think you're in that camp where you knew right from the get go there was not a moment where you didn't know, but it seems like many people then want to kind of get facts and figures and kind of figure it out by from so-called experts speaking and then you're in hot water because then you're starting to trust <laughs> um yeah you you actually you, what's underneath that is doubt in your de- in your own knowing and so once that's happened i mean then how do you speak out because you know you, you don't know you're not speaking from authority you're speaking from you know what some experts said but you know it's like so i'd say that's part of it where people aren't really in tune with their own knowing around some but you know it's like to me i would say in all of our experience if you we've we've had it where you step into the road and suddenly there's a car coming that you didn't see I mean, you, you you wouldn't sit down and meditate at that moment. You would definitely get out the way. <laughs> so it's like there is something happening. It's like this huge thrust of um, an agenda that's that's not. I mean, from everything I can see, it's not in anyone's best interest except the pharmaceutical companies and the point one percent who want more control. It's like and so it has nothing to do with so-called COVID or anything like that. I mean, yeah, trust the science, but there's no liability for anything we do. It's just, it's, it's such a It, it seems to, nonsense, be, to, be, to, to be educating us completely out of our own intuition. When you say you see things with yeah. your eyes, you have your own intuition, and then everybody's saying, well, where's the studies? Where's the science? Is it, is it what's happening here? Is there some bizarre force taking us away from our um, f- f- from f- from our own ancestral awareness of, of, of what's going on? And don't trust yourself. Trust the science. Trust this making this new yeah. religion. Yeah. 
I mean, it, it, yeah. to me, I, it, it seems like, you know, Cliff High, who we listen to so quite often, and maybe there is some mantid being under the ice in Antarctica sort of controlling all these world leaves. Everything is so weird at the moment that I just wonder how it came about. How has this mass hypnosis happened? And do you think it's going to be broken? This is, look, it, it's hard to know where it's going. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's like this, this agenda has been very well planned for many, many years, and there's a ton of money behind it. And, there's, and you just see the billions that the pharmaceutical companies are raking, and it's unprecedented. It's like... So to, you know, to pay people, to blackmail people, to do whatever the hell is necessary is, is easy. So, you know, coming back to what I was saying earlier, it's like to the extent that there's unconscious mechanisms playing in consciousness, there's no choice. When it's automatic and unconscious, people have, there is zero choice. If we just look at that, if something's happening automatically and consciously, who's doing it for one thing? I would say it's just the momentum of our conditioning and our trauma. There is nobody actually doing it. So to the extent that fear is used and it's a, a two-pronged um, mechanism, first fear and then guilt look, you have to do this for the good of everybody. And if you don't, you're guilty. And, you know, like this big bad thing is going to happen to you, even though like the st stats are like what? <laughs> Hardly anybody uh, dies. Most people that get it done, even though they have it. I mean, it's really bizarre, the amount of... But that's all from using the media. It's just like Goebbels did or any of the great dictators. They just, you know, they, they used... The, the, those two things and uh, once once that's triggered in the nervous system people can't think clearly they don't see you know, they don't have the capacity anymore so it's like and when I say people I just say this human experience because once it's going through the, tra the trauma vortexes it's just about trying to survive and you know one of the things that for me has happened from recognizing that my nature, my true nature is awareness, which doesn't have a beginning and end. The whole fear of transitioning or dying or anything like that just doesn't have much um, juice. It's just like, okay, I go to sleep at night. I absolutely love going to sleep. It's such a nice drop into nothing. <laughs> so, um, you know, this... I once had this woman come to one of my meetings who since a child has had this great fear of dying and she'd spent thousands on trying to come to the end of it. And she came on stage and asked me, could I help her with it? And I went, okay. And just sat with her for a moment. I said, look, are you afraid of dying? Or are you afraid of the idea of dying? And she stopped for a moment and she said, oh my God. <laughs> afraid of the idea of dying and I asked her she, and just this big release happened and I asked her please send me an email in a little while just to find that out and she said that fear left and never came back after years of huge suffering so you know we can see just the power of one thought it's like um, so we hear and you know it's interesting to see this thing because we, the way we speak, we sound breathing. But if you really look, who's breathing? The breathing is just happening. Nobody's doing it. And similarly, we say I'm thinking, but there's a little experiment we can do where you just say, okay, if you think you're thinking, just stop for five minutes and you'll see that you're not thinking. It just keeps going. And so um, there's this whole idea that there's a me that's living my life. But really, when you get a little bit quieter, there's trillions of cells all doing their dance. And there's a little activity going, should I have a cappuccino, a latte, or a steak, in our case, uh, <laughs> that thinks it's in, in charge of everything. 
there's you know like i mean if you've ever seen the inner workings of a cell there's these beautiful videos of it it's like whoa man there's some other intelligence functioning and there's just on the surface is this little sense of why that thinks it's running the show so it's, it's, it's wonderful, uh, isn't it? I mean, this is this is how I, I this is the, the the approach I take with, with with clients who come to me with some sort of physical issue or even depression or whatever something. It's it's just getting out of the way on all levels, isn't it? You know, yeah. intelligence is there in the body yeah. Yeah. to sort itself out. You just yeah. need to figure out what it is that you've put in the way, and 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 that's lovely with the fear of death. I mean, I think I think a whole load of the, the the stuff that's going on at the moment is is fear of death. I mean, pretty much every fear is rooted in the fear of death if you trace it back, and when that's largely yeah. gone, there's far less fear about anything else. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you, know, so, uh, you know, what is, like, if you really go deep into what is, is fear, I mean, here we are, this moment is a sensation to us. And what's interesting, the word emotion literally means with motion, with movement. So all the emotions actually are a movement away from sensation. The, the, the tricky part, though, is that those movements away from sensation are automatic and unconscious and the movement away always is loud so it pulls our attention and there's it moves in the direction of wanting to change fix or get rid of and that just cements it in there but if otherwise they just pass through like nothing there's no there's nothing <laughs> so it's it's interesting starting to see how how consciousness functions it's just uh but it's a it, the big question, that thing of seeing, like how different um, expressions of totality, because that's all that each, what we call an individual is, because even at the physical level, you know, it's like, I ask people, where does your body begin and end, or your bodying activity, because it's a verb, it's not a noun, where does this bodying activity begin and end, and people go at my skin, I go, really? And what about breathing? Does the spotting activity continue without breathing? Oh, no, it doesn't. So obviously, so then where's the beginning? You know, like where, if you take breathing into account and breathing doesn't happen without the sun and, you know, the, the whole process that you have, the core of the earth wasn't magnetic and we, you know, we, we didn't have this little band of oxygen. We just wouldn't be any of this stuff going on. So really and truly, where does this body begin and end? And it's all made of, you know, burnt out stars to begin with. So it's like, you know, from a certain perspective, there's a certain feeling sense of being separate, but once you start looking a little deeper, you see, man, <laughs> it's, just, it's just some, yeah, some intelligence expressing itself in all these different ways that doesn't really have a beginning and end. And it's just absolutely. And and I think one of the biggest misconceptions that people get into, and I I, I see them and, and they think, you know, it's all about meditation. It's funny because <clears throat> the point where everything became clear to me was the moment where I decided to give up all of my spiritual practices and meditation. It was in that instant. It, it was like, oh my God, there's everything. There it is suddenly. Oh, 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 I'd sit down on this wall in the garden and, and there it was, everything I'd always been looking for. And, and, and it was from getting rid of that, you know, and even though I thought, oh, I'm a great yogi and a great meditation, all that nonsense. But I think that a lot of people seem to think that, that, that you have to sort of silence the mind, quieten the mind, force yourself down. And this to me falls into the whole thing. It has the same flavor really as allopathic medicine. It's not how things work. So you must have a lot of people yeah. saying this. I mean, thoughts, as you say, you can't, you try and stop thinking it doesn't happen. If they fall away for a while, that's great. Mm -hmm. but that, that is no, not a better state mm -hmm. to my mind or than, than uh, uh, when the thoughts are there. So can you just speak to you, a bit about, about people yeah, yeah. thoughts down and yeah, you know, in in the Advaita, um, they they talk about the, the highest natural state is called the highest samadhi, and it's not a thought-free state. It's just like thoughts come and go, but there's nothing that 
grabs onto the thinking. So, you know, just out of this interest in this, when I look at this capacity of thinking that's arisen in these expressions of life that we call people, it's like, it's, it's relatively new. I mean, I think, you know, like, <laughs> I don't know how much thinking there was 100,000 years ago, or, you know, it's like, it's relatively new on the scene, this capacity to think, because language didn't really come in until, um, you know, hunter-gatherers don't need much many words. It's like, you know, you see baboons, they just got sounds and it, it does the job, so to speak. But once agriculture got discovered and then, you know, the, it moved into small bands becoming, you know, little tribes and then towns and then cities and multinational corporations. I mean, it's like just a steady thing. But then language came in and this whole thing, because it, it, it influences the way seeing happens. We see things as nouns and we refer to, um, you know, this, the sense of me. And it's interesting to try and research when that sense of me arose, because that's also, it's, uh, you know, to my seeing, it's, it's relatively new in the whole scene. It's, uh, um, but anyway, it's like, so, but this thinking, what, what it is, is the capacity to solve problems. And it's a fantastic capacity. And then it's like, but I notice that whenever there's, you know, deep well being, there's not many thoughts. When there's any sense of dis ease, not being at ease, our thinking tries to help us by trying to solve what the disease is. And so the way our thinking works, it looks as, okay, what's the problem? And once it seems, it thinks it's identified the problem, whatever it thinks it is, it doesn't want that, which means we have it. Whatever you don't want, you have. Then it's going to come up with a solution. And whatever the solution is, we want it, which means we don't have it. So whenever we in that, you know, looking through the filter of our thinking, we have everything we don't want, and we don't have everything we do want. That's why it's called suffering. It's terrible. And then the only thing you've got is that maybe one day in the future, it'll be better, which is then chasing enlightenment or chasing something, or, you know, more money or more women or more men or whatever your thing is. But if you just hear, and I love this, like, for me, this invitation of meeting the moment as the beloved. Is it possible, you know, like, wow, just to be caressed by totality right now? Yes, all this information. And it's a little shift in, and suddenly it starts to feel really groovy. It's like, uh, <laughs> you know, and the moment there's no problem, like thinking seems to drop away because there's nothing. I mean, then, you know, like I could say, the the daily thinking that oh yeah tomorrow okay what's on my list or you know like thinking like that seems to somehow come up from my mom's but other than that it's just like oh wow wow so, yeah it's, it's... You know, I, I, I love that like meeting the moment as the beloved because we haven't been invited in our culture in our schooling you know our families, our family systems, you know, it's like, you know, you're a sinner and maybe you'll get to heaven later, but now you have to suffer, man. Your shoulder to the grindstone, I mean, your nose to the grindstone and then your shoulder to the wheel. It's like, that's the paradigm. Yeah, same, so same. I'll, be, I'll be happy when is the start of the road to unhappiness. I, I noticed it so much. It was very obvious in, in, in my healing when I, I was... Yeah completely crippled with rheumatoid arthritis it was incredibly painful I was stuck on the sofa you know and and I was fighting and at one mm -hmm. point I just thought right I'm gonna have to find out out a way to be completely content even if I have this for the rest of my life and at that mm -hmm. point the healing turned around because I accepted that mm -hmm. and then honestly it, it, the pain in joints for example i would just completely focus on one joint and go all right let's have as much pain as you as, as you can give me now what are you trying to tell me what's going on here and just relax into it 
And I would get actually the pain would turn into complete localized bliss as if the body was saying, thank God you're not fighting me anymore, you know, and, and I get really. What a discovery, eh? Yeah. And when people get what a discovery, people get uh, cancer and they say, I'm fighting this. I'm, and I think you're in trouble. You've got to accept it, see where it's taking you. And then there's many other little things that you can do to take away things that cause that. But right now you've got to be completely accepting of it, you know. When people are still so let, let's 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 play with that because there's a subtlety that 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 I see to me, like when fighting is happening, if it's happening automatically and unconsciously, and someone says, you know, you have to stop that, the conscious mind versus the unconscious mind it's no it's it, it doesn't really work so for me i go the other way around i go okay good fighting is happening in this moment just notice that fighting is happening who's doing it oh nobody it's just happening okay cool now just in your own knowing right now that fighting it in this moment does it bring peace beauty love is it useful in any way does it and so then then there's a looking at it and seeing, oh, wow. So there's a learning that happens. It's not like you have to try and drop it. There's a, just a seeing. It's okay. It's, it, and so the way you describe it, what happened for you, there was a deep seeing and it just dropped by itself. You didn't decide to drop it. There was just like somehow <laughs> revealed. So that's kind of yeah. how I play. Yeah. It's not a question of accepting, it's just saying, okay, if there's resistance somewhere along the line in our ancestry or in this lifetime, or maybe when you're in the womb, resistance was going on and got taken on without, before there was any discrimination to recognize what it did. And so then it's, it's an unconscious movement, it's an unconscious activity going on, and probably it's been going on for most of our lives. But then there comes a moment where you can you know, inquire into it. Okay, there's resistance happening. Who? Cool. Who's doing it? Is any, you know, like, is it just automatic and unconscious? Then nobody's doing it. Cool. Now, what does that resistance in the moment produce? Does it, is it helpful in any way? Is it useful? No. Okay, now you're starting to come back into tune with your own knowing. You know, it's like you... It's, it's, so to me, it seems like, you know, when I was traveling a lot um, in the good, good old days, <laughs> you know, you're sleeping in a different house or something like that. And then, you know, I, I'm at the age where you have to get up to go pee. And sometimes there's a step in the way. And maybe the first night or the two, first two nights, you bump into that step. But once you've done it once or twice, you, your body just knows it and it stops doing it. So it's like once something gets seen consciously, even if it's been going on for years, it changes the whole thing. So to me, that's like the, that seems like, the, you know, the, what is the seeing of who you are, then this interest in, wow, how does, how does this stuff work? You know, it's like, cool, because there's a deep interest to, you know, allow whatever wants to reveal itself to show itself. But, you know, the, the, uh, somehow we've grown up in this, idea of working on ourselves which is such a funny paradigm because it's like there's a me and myself or something to there's two of us <laughs> i know it's a funny one i when when i speak to people who because most of the people i speak to are really suffering you know with something pretty horrific yeah. and it, this is always in my mind that there is just this acceptance or whatever you like or, or acceptance of the fact that there is no acceptance or what it's so difficult to put into words but yeah. to, to that point but there are sort of there it's, it's very difficult to get anybody to think of anything apart from their own pain while they're, they're in pain so then it's funny because i always thought that i i would end up as some kind of uh, somebody who would speak about this non-duality all the time it's such a surprise to me I, i've ended up as the, that carnivore guy you know, it's, it's, it's mm. like the weirdest fork in the road. But quite often, once you've taken away uh, the suffering on the gross level, then people can be led to all sorts of magic, you know, or lead themselves to all sorts of magic. You, 
you know, that's the other thing that I see. It's like, you know, because, we, I mean, we, we sharing experience, you know, when someone, what looks like someone, when an expression of life called a person <laughs> and, and our systems meet, for me, there's just a resting and um, not engaging in the, you know, the, the dynamic that's happening, the resistance that's happening in that expression. And what happens is, I'd say most times, 98% of the time, their system just starts to calm down literally within seconds. It's, I don't have to speak, I don't have to do anything. And then like a, there's like a resonance that starts to flow backwards and forwards. And all of a sudden they see for themselves. And then I ask, how's the pain now? And they go, oh, it's not here at this moment. And they go far out. So that's cool. Eh? That gives some information. Because it only, you know, if it's not here right now, what does it tell you? That there's something going on that produces that pain. That's not happening at this moment. So let's see if we can see what that is. Yeah, that's lovely. Because it's like, you know, yeah, because when I sit with you, I can see you, you, know, you there's a resting uh, that's exquisite. And it's just, so uh, that communicates itself. Yeah, I'm quite, I'm quite chilled out. I think I'd, I'd rather just sit here and listen to you, you know. I think, oh, yeah, it's my show. I'd probably better say <laughs> something now and again, but I'd rather be lazy and just chill out, you know. I know, it's funny, isn't it? But what do you think? What do you think? You're changing the subject a bit, but this has always fascinated me because it's something I got caught up in, as I, that I see other people getting caught up in. Either they believe that this type of awareness is not possible, or they're frantic seekers who believe that all these strange things are going to happen, like you're going to be able to fly, like you're going to be able to have absolute mm -hmm. omniscience that you know it's been built up yeah. into such a grandiose thing that it's only the only the domain of 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 some sage miles up in the himalayas with a loincloth that you're never going to meet why is it why mm -hmm. has it become so unobtainable why is it why is again more knowledge hidden so let's, let's let's just look at let's look at something very simple in this instant if there's seeking you can't, then it's in the activity of seeking, you're really not here. Just this, this, just that little activity, already this moment is missed because you're looking for something else other than what's here. Isn't it? Yeah. So that's, that's the misnomer. But, you know, where, where there's, I think confusion is there's a natural activity that goes on once the seeking stops, which I could call the revealing, where, you know, I could say unconscious habits that have been playing sometimes for generations start to get seen and become conscious and drop away or integrate, whatever you want to call that. So that, that, that might go on until our last breath. I mean, I, you know, it's like, and I just noticed that as those, act as those unconscious activities reveal themselves and drop away, man, there's so much more available for this moment. And then, you know, like it does, it does change. You know, we live in a different frequency then. You know, you're not, the frequency of seeking and trying to change and fix is like the ultimate postponement. You're never quite there. You never, you know, and you're living on hope, and that hope is always sounds like so great, but means hoping you're not here. You basically you postponing till later. It's like um, so it it's, it tricks us. It tricks you know many many um, expressions of life. But as it starts to show, and it seems like quite right here. This is it. This is. You know, I like to joke, I say, this moment is as God as it gets. It doesn't get more God than this. This is it. <laughs> Who you are, you already are. It's like any effort to get anywhere else completely obscures what's here. So, 
if that's recognized, then it's like, okay, what happens if I if something just gets quiet? It's just like, okay, it's not trying to get quiet. It just, and then it, somehow that's where I see um, from the perspective of the nervous system, the nervous system will come into regulation with whatever the nervous system is the most coherent. So when you're just resting there like that, whoever's you know like resting with you, their system will come into coherence with your system or with that system, whatever whoever system it is. I can't say it's yours because that's funny way of speaking, but it's just yeah. I think one of the one of the the misconceptions is as well that you know this sort of infinitely wise thing and you're finished. To me, it was more like being a complete baby again. You know, that yeah. I, I just it, there was <laughs> it was a reset button, and and suddenly there's all this stuff that unfolds in front of you. I can understand why some people get completely spaced out for a couple of years and can't do anything like sort of you know byron katie i can't tell you things like that just sit and feed the pigeons or whatever or stare off into yeah. the distance but once that's stabilized and, it, and it's there as a running as an automatic program it, it honestly so it, it, most of the things the useful things that i've learned have been since then and and people think that it's all a matter of just sitting there and doing absolutely nothing but it's such a wonderful experience, isn't it? To look into all of these things. And then you have such an open mind because I think this is probably one of the biggest advantages of it in, in, in everyday life. It's that you have an open mind and you never get stuck in one particular dogma. And if something you did, did, that sounds absolutely ridiculous, it just goes into a, a file that says, that's interesting, but I don't know. You know, I, I feel I feel one of the most awful things about getting caught up in this present situation must be the people who are absolutely, utterly sure of what's going on. And that mm -hmm. must be a, a proper torment, because I'm, I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I mean, viewpoints, opinions, they change every single day. W what do you think about that? Is there is, is is it the same for you that it's just like, hey this is going on and, and it'll reveal itself in time, maybe as the levels of the onion of deception get peeled back, but what the hell, yeah. you know, how, how the fixed attitudes and the aggression. And the, I think, I think, you know, you mentioned something wonderful about how we are just expressions of consciousness. And it, it, like, as our Rick, our friend Rick puts it, sense organs of the infinite. It's a nice expression, but so many of them are being squashed down now, you know, and this seems like, yeah. Yeah. I can't figure out, is this against nature or is this just nature playing out? Is this something that needs to be unwound or is it because if you're squashing down various sense organs of the infinite, the infinite's yeah. not really seeing as it should. But then again, possibly it is. And it's seeing exactly as it should. This is one thing that I wrestle with. What do you think? You know, <clears throat> if we can believe that, you know, the first life was single cell organisms and they were so successful that it's and they were anaerobic means that oxygen was poisonous to them but then somehow they were so successful and it's so abundant at some point they started to become multiple cell organisms which actually produced oxygen which was poisonous to the single cell organisms so you know from the single cell organism point of view that would have been terrible but it was just the next movement of this expression of intelligence in a certain way. And it's in a similar way, you know, like dinosaurs were around for, you know, if we believe in dinosaurs, again, it's like, we just don't know. It's a, such a weird thing that, you know, 200 million years or so, and then something happened. And then this little rat became an ape, became have you seen? Have you seen something. This Facebook group called Christians Against Dinosaurs. And now there's one's called Christians Against Christians Against Dinosaurs. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> it's a, you know, it's like, you know, like to put it in, like, you know, like some people when Twin Towers happened, 
they were late because they spilled coffee on their clothes and they were, oh, fuck, I'm going to be late and all. And then, oh, fuck, thank God I spilled coffee on my clothes. So we don't really know what anything is good for. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's like like in the Ramayana, you're talking about the Gita, you know, at one point Krishna, in the story, he went to uh, Arjuna and said, listen, we have to take action because if we don't, this will happen. And, you know, Arjuna said, but these are my uncles and cousins. He said, yes, but look, we, the action needs to be taken. So, you know, we hear and some people are called to action. Some people, you know, speak out. Other people are afraid, whatever it is. But it's, in a way, it's like, it is shifting consciousness in quite a, an amazing way. There's a, you know, there's a bunch of people that have swallowed the, I don't, can't remember whether it's the red pill or the blue pill, but they have so totally into the story and there's others that are going, wait, look, this isn't, you know, this running after more and more money, this, look, actually, I just want to live on the earth and enjoy the sunshine and watch the flowers grow and be with friends and play music. And, you know, it's like, so there's a, in some sense, hard to know where it'll, you know, what the next, big step is but you know like in most indigenous cultures and there's been many prophecies and interesting to see that how the pro talk about a golden age or you know like so i don't know i just know that you know i see what's going on and i hear these stories that are unbelievably heartbreaking and but, you know, like when the heart breaks, it can either break open or it can break shut. And so for me, it's been allowing the heart just to break open and open and open and just, okay, here I am. I'm not moving. Just. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's beautiful. I think it's a time where it's, it's, it's uncovering a whole load of misconceptions and a whole load of lunacies. And ho hopefully yeah, this will, this will, you know make people aware of what's going on but then again i i've seen it a little bit but a, a lot of people are mentioning who seem to be aware of these kind of things that there is a <clears throat> there is a a, a a hardening of the consciousness and a, a narrowing of the of the viewpoint and 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 sort of just sort of iq points going down and all sorts among the people who've had this jab have you felt any oh, oh look look i vibe on that to me i i like it seems to me that this is going to be a time of a lot of people transitioning leaving this yeah so that's looks like it's it's going on you know when if i look at it it's it was very clear to me that the monetary system that we've developed and the political system that we've developed especially because they so entwined is not human friendly or planet friendly. And it's shifted, you know, it's like shifted the orientation um, of humanity in a way that's it's not sustainable. It's not, you know, it's like we, looks like we're heading to the sixth grade extinction or whatever it is. But some, some of us will survive. In what form, I have no idea, but you know, life is amazing how it adapts and how it does its thing when you look at, you know, what, what scientists tell us have happened. I, again, it's one of those things. We, but we hear and we're watching this movie and I guess, to me, if I we have to bring it down to its most simplistic, there's this moment and there's either something that resists, contracts, or there's something that gets caressed. So it's either owl or it's well. And whenever I notice an owl, there's like an automatic exploration of what's going on. I don't even have to, there's nobody that does it. There's just a recognition. Oh, wow, something might be so familiar. It might have done it a million times before, but suddenly it's recognized. Okay, something just got, something tightened up, something went into, 
resistance, not me, something automatic and unconscious, because I would never do that. And then it's oh, okay, something, you know, just postpones happiness or moves into making something more important than this moment. And wow, that's amazing. How does that happen? It's, <laughs> it's far out. Eh? It's just like, yeah. Yeah, it's funny when that's, yeah. if anyone's listening, it's, it's, it's a difficult one, this one, because I just want to sit here and chat and hang out. And, and a lot of interviews are not on this level. And, and you can think about questions. But when you ever focus on this kind of thing and you get completely in the present, I'm constantly thinking, I'm sure I had a question there. <laughs> and it's slipping yeah. away. You know, Phil, <laughs> if, you, if you like, if anybody watches this and they want to send you the questions, we can do another one and just address whatever comes up. Yeah, cool. we, should because... do, we, should do, we should do a live one sometime. That would be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that I mean, would be a lot of fun. I, did, I did want to touch on is, is have you seen this this bizarre thing of, you know, uh, of the veganism and vegetarianism and whatever and how it's been lumped onto spirituality. And now now this whole business of ascension people are talking about. Nobody ascends if they eat animal meat <laughs> and, all the, you know, eat animals. And and it seems to be the whole business of that seems to be very disrespectful to me because it's suggesting that nobody had this level of consciousness who was in the hunter gatherer tribes or in any of these indigenous tribes. You're telling me that? No, I don't believe it. I think they were very mm -hmm. close to this. I think they're very close to nature and the earth and understanding what was going on. And now we've got this very strange thing where spirituality has co-opted this vegetarianism thing. And now they're not even seeing it, even among the community that is awake, if you like, to, to what's going on. A lot of them are still pursuing this vegetarian and vegetarianism and veganism thing. I see it when I go play with with the Daz band, you know, at these these rallies and whatever. Lovely people and all that, but this in this, and they don't seem to have twigged that what is Bill Gates actually pushing? What are they pushing here? And I mean, I'd, I'd just like to ask you because it's it's very rare. It, it's it's actually not that common these days to to have as somebody who has has got this level of awareness and speaks about this kind of stuff i'm resisting using the word spiritual teacher but you know even a, even somebody even a seeker or something it's rare to find somebody who actually mm -hmm. eats meat so what happened with you when i started eating like this because i eat nothing but meat for six years i found that everything completely grounded i found that it was incredibly mm -hmm. uh, um, um uh, beneficial to to my whole uh, that whole side of things and I have a previous podcast called 100% Carnivore and Beyond, where I just did 10 episodes. But these wonderful people who've not only fi fixed spirit, um, um, physical things, but emotional, spiritual and all sorts by eating meat. You know, it stabilizes everything. So so tell, tell me, Isaac, what's your experience of, of, of eating a load of meat? Has it destroyed your awareness? Has it ruined your consciousness? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think, again, what, what tends to happen is if we look at how meat is farmed these days, factory farmed and all that stuff, you know, that's, in, that's horrific. And um, obviously when uh, you're eating meat like that, that, that uh, you know, has, hasn't, you know, been grain fed or whatever the story is and f kept in feed lots and stuff, I wouldn't even call that food. That's like, you know, so there's a difference and, and we know that, cattle can be raised where they where they actually restore the earth and you know i mean the people that have really figured that out how to do that and you can see when they show you the videos of how, how the land had been degraded and then they started doing those kind of farming practices it's a whole different relationship with with um with life and it's the same thing you know it's like in my story um you know, I was a hippie and then I kind of had this whole idea of I came from the city, I wanted to go and learn how to farm and all that stuff. So I figured the, the easiest way was to go to a kibbutz because you can just go and get experience. And so I went to this uh, kibbutz and the first job they had put me on was driving a tractor, spreading these... I looked at what was what the shit I was spraying on the vegetable, and we're going to eat that shit. 
I mean, that was a shock to me. I never knew that that's what happened to our food. And then you go to the chicken house and, you know, there's three chickens in the cage where only two can be in the ground at one time. So they never get to rest. They, and you start seeing and, you know, like them taking these babies away from the cows, away from their mom, and they, right at birth. And, the, you know, the mothers are screaming and the babies are screaming. I mean, it's just like, wow how we've got so far away from ourselves, from life. From, so whether it's, you know, like you're eating vegetables that have been, you know, Roundup ready sprayed and all that crap and kill the, the biodiversity of the soils and, you know, like, wow, it's, so to me, we, you know, when you're talking about eating meat, it's like, a, it's a whole thing of coming into tune with, with nature in a different way that's, that, um, you know, like, it seems to me that living is, you could say killing. I mean, we're always living in other life forms. Ultimately, we're living on, on converted sunlight. That's all that, you know, like, every, every, that's what plants do. And then we eat the plants or we eat the animals. It's like, it's, it's just basically energy. And um, oh, if, if anyone's interested, I just on my Facebook page, I just posted a short clip by Zach Bush, who is incredibly, an incredible mind where he talks about, you know, like the sun actually, it, because there's no air, the surface of the sun is minus 273 degrees centigrade. It's absolute zero. It's only when it, it comes into contact with air that it actually produces heat. So in space, there is no heat at all. It's freezing. So um, it's a blast to recognize that. And then, but then somehow the, that that heat and that solar energy gets converted into food, which our systems through the mitochondria then produces energy. So, and yeah, but yeah, uh, I don't see. Beautiful thing. I, th I think um, I, I think you're absolutely right. And what the vegans and vegetarians don't realise, I think, is that there's nobody I've seen more aware of animal cruelty and and them being fed the wrong things than the carnivore community, and have a, an idea of what to do about it. You know, this is why most people who understand about this pretty much avoid pork and chicken because they've all always been fed horrendous things and had it, you know, been in uh, appalling uh, appalling uh, living conditions. And so the, the meat is inflammatory, but, but, you know, it, it's funny, it could, this hopefully will bring about, uh, you know, an awareness of this because they're trying to take away our ancestral food. I think, I think living on, as far as I can see, my experience, my, my, my observations of what's been going on and, and, and history of, I think plant-based diets have, have, have been almost clogging up the ability for people to see to their full awareness. You know, I mean, at a simple physical level, the brain is made of saturated fat. And now they tell us saturated fat is the most dangerous thing to eat. And, and uh, you know, it, it, to me, it has it's brought an awareness, far more of an awareness and a connection to nature and an understanding of what's going on to do that, to, to, mm -hmm. to eat nothing but meat, which I don't think everybody needs to do. But, uh, you know, to take away all our ancestral food and something's going on here. It's all part of the agenda as well. And, and I, I would my, my thing is to just... I, you know, I've made a lot of videos on carnivore diet and spirituality, and I think it's a very important thing, having been somebody who's, you know, had their mobility saved by discovering this, really. But, but you know, part of that agenda, and I, I would love to stamp that out from, from the spiritual community. And I think everybody should do exactly what they want and eat exactly what they want, but just to be aware that, you know, stop attacking people for eating meat. It isn't that simple. I mean, you've shown many different yeah. layers of it there. Yeah. And I mean, you know, with diet too, it's like, you know, I've just seen with different healing methods, you know, like you go to an Ayurvedic person, they say, eat only cooked. You go somewhere else, they say, only eat raw. You go somewhere else. <laughs> so there's so many different ideas and it's, it's, some of them work for everybody. You, you know, it's like, that's what's amazing. You see people that, that heal by trying something and it works and then other people they try it it doesn't work so what i've just seen is you keep kind of playing and seeing what works for you that's all until you find <laughs> yeah so what do you think about 
um, this business of people thinking that this uh, be, having this awareness is very rare you know back onto this business of waking up and <clears throat> i see what what fascinated me about the times you know before i was excommunicated from buddha at the gas pump was I, I you know if somebody came on with a load of teachings or something i'd sort of i'd space out i wasn't interested but i did love the stories i did love to think mm -hmm. Is there a way that people can be made aware of this? You know, that like some people, it would be sort of 30 years of practicing Zazen meditation and another person was crossing the road and stepped in a dog poo. You know, there it, it doesn't seem to be yeah. any consistency to it at all. Mm -hmm. But do you think this is a really, uh, it, it, it's, it's, um, it qualifies to be put up on the pedestal it's put on? Is it quite common? Are there people walking around? who've got this awareness who might not even know you know I, to me it's a very simple slight slight shift compared to as you say yeah. all the rest of the miracles going on in the body and the, and the mind and the mitochondria and the mm -hmm. planet you know just to be aware on that level is a very very small shift really it is miraculous but it's a small shift so what do you think is there an epidemic of it i think there might have been recently or is it just we've become more aware of it you know i mean you It's, it's interesting, you know, it's like a hundred years ago, you would have to try and find someone uh, who knew directly and where were, you know, where would you find someone? It was like, you know, it's 200 years ago, you were living in a little village somewhere in Europe and, you know, the priest, if you got on the bad terms with the priest, you're in deep shit. And, you know, <laughs> nowadays you can just go on the internet and hear, you know, a thousand different expressions of this. So it's like, and seems to me that it's becoming, it's twofold. It's like there's this, you know, the speed is, is, has, um, the freneticness has really increased a lot with all, you know, like people struggling just to make enough money to kind of get by. And then some people, you know, it seems like what's, when there's enough suffering, somehow there's an openness to look differently. So maybe suffering is part of it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I guess it's the same thing. Seeking doesn't end suffering. It just increases it in a funny kind of a way. And so, uh, you know, at some point <laughs> there's a stopping. And uh, that, was an, uh, that was another one of my points in this thing that I wrote. I'll, I'll post it up underneath along with, along with how to find Isaac, you know, because it's, it's kind of interesting. There's the, the suffering thing. I think the most suffering I've ever been through was, was, was after that. It didn't end it at all. <laughs> But it had a different flavor to it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and, you know, I mean, to me, it just seems in a, you can, you can have billions and you can be famous if you don't know who you are and suffering is happening. I mean, it means nothing, you know, that's the whole thing. And so just the because at some point there's a recognition that being at peace is not dependent on any circumstance. I mean, it, you know, it's, 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 it's not dependent on circumstance. It's not dependent on anything. And that's what's so beautiful. It's like, you know, you don't have to wear a certain uniform. It's not dependent on anything external at all. It's just that little shift of attention recognizing directly okay wow this right like this is, everything is here everything is here and uh yeah what do you have to say to people who are under the impression that you need lifetimes of dedicated spiritual practice or at least many decades or something like that when people come to you with that kind of attitude what do what, what do you say to them you know, it comes down to the simplicity. There's only this moment. There is only this moment. Everything else is imagination. The future isn't here. It's just a thought. The past also is stuck. Just 
pictures in your mind. And if you come down to this moment, there's just these sensations and we, we don't really know what's going on. And we can't even describe this moment. It's like it's changing too quickly. So even in, in, you could try, but it's just we don't know and we can't describe it. And it's just, that's how it is. And so then there's just these little automatic movements where something goes into resistance. And then, some, then from the, the moment it does that, it feels like there's something wrong somewhere. And then the thinking tries to help us and then we're running, you know, to try and fix it or change it or just missing, just. <laughs> Spot on. I mean, <laughs> what, what do you say, what do you say to, to the people who think that you will never have any desires? You must be desireless because that's a bit of a misnomer to me yeah absolutely it's like you know um first of all you know like who has like you know just on a very simple level you're just sitting there at some point there's a desire to take a pee you know or a poop or whatever it is it's like you know, you might not fit into the classic desires, but it's definitely, you know, it's a signal that something needs to happen. And man, the, you know, the, the absolute bliss of taking a pee when you really need to. I mean, it's one of the... <laughs> but, you know, that's if you're not so busy with everything else, if you're just really enjoying that... Um, release it's it's yeah it's exquisite so it's like to me um it's again making distinctions you know it's like uh so we can sit here and a, a thought can come wow i wish i had a few million bucks or whatever it is you're in england pounds okay so that's a thought and if if attention follows that thought and you know like some unhappiness arises around that thought then all of a sudden you're running you know like i'm not going to be happy until i have that that uh, other than that the thought just comes oh yeah it's a thought and it goes and then just back here and you know it's like or, you know, I want to get laid or something, whatever the thought is, you know, what, you know, what are the big things for human beings is, uh, I would say, yeah, pleasure or um, feeling safe. And uh, yeah, the capacity to enjoy the moment, ultimately, what everybody wants is just to be able to be at peace. That's, that's ultimately it. And that recognition that's all we ever want. And the rest of the stuff, I mean, you know, it's like it comes and goes and can't hold. And that's the other thing with, you know, like I, I don't think we can hold on to any experience, the highest high or the lowest low, they all seem to slip through our fingers. They come and they go. And trying to hold on to anything that's, that's ephemeral like that is crazy. Then it comes, you enjoy it, it goes, it's, then it goes. You know, and it, it, it's, it's interesting to look at, you know, what makes something enjoyable? If someone gives you a really great piece of chocolate, if you, if you, it's not your thing, it means nothing. And so, and if you do are into chocolate and you just had a fight with someone, do you really, can you really enjoy that chocolate or you really, your mind is busy with the whole story. So what makes something enjoyable, you know, a sunset or a, or a piece of music is the quality of attention that we bring to it. It's not the music itself. So it's never external actually, you know, so same thing with making love. If you're there and you, you know, you're trying to, 
get someone to love you, or trying to, you know, please someone, man, it's, then it's a job, it's not uh, fun anymore. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah, nice. I um think that uh, there, there was, you know, this this business that you're saying of of you um you know things not just thoughts not being real and whatever. I can't remember. I just wonder if it was a Papaji story, but somebody who was late to go and see some guru somewhere or something, and he said, "Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I'm late. I've 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 just been communing with Krishna and." All, the, all these gods and I've had this amazing experience and it's absolutely wonderful and then and then whoever it was you know who'd gone to see said well are they here now it's, it's actually it's, that right? it, it, that's the story when Papaji met Ramana that okay that's right that's right that's I knew yeah. it was somehow connected to Ramana are they here now yeah. wasn't it yeah. no yeah exactly that, no, and that was the moment that Papaji realized because for him I mean his story when he was a kid, he dropped into this bliss state for a few days and his parents couldn't get him out of it, even when they shook him or offered him ice cream. And when he finally did come out of it, his mother told him that that was a visit from Krishna. And from then on, he became an absolute uh, crazy about Krishna. Like any breath that didn't have Krishna's name on it was a wasted breath. And he, like it was so intense for him that Krishna and all the gods started appearing to him. And, um, you know, he would eat with them. And then after when they would disappear, he had these residues of food, not from his region on his fingers and all this crazy shit there, you know, that, but just from this intense kind of belief in that. And when, um, when he got to Ramana Ashram, um, he was disappointed at first in Ramana. So, you know, he had a few days before he had to report to work. So he went and did his usual thing, playing with Krishna on the mountain. And when he came back to Ramana, and Ramana said, where have you been? He said, I've been playing with Krishna. Ramana said, where is he now? And Papaji said, oh, he's not here. And Ramana just said, what comes and goes is not real. And <laughs> disappeared the world for property. Yeah, that's exactly. That's a lovely story. It's very cool. Yeah. So another one that 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 I always find quite amusing is squashing down the ego. We must be egoless. We must get rid of the ego. Yeah, what is exactly? What is an ego? What is an ego? Well, whatever is there that's the ego after that is just a useful tool, but it's... Yeah, but what is an ego? I mean, at best, all it is, is, a, you know, like a cycle of thoughts. Mm. Because when we go to deep sleep, there's nothing. The, the, all activity stops and there's nothing. There. And then we wake up. And sometimes there's a moment upon waking where the senses are awake and there's nothing. And there's, then suddenly these thoughts start coming in. What do I have to do today? What, you know, who owes me money? Who am I upset with? You know, like, uh, <laughs> so, and those, those thoughts, that cycle of thoughts is what we call the ego. But if, those, if that stops for you know, a moment, there's just presence. And then, you know, so it's like, but somehow that, that, that there's a tendency to, keep you know like somehow feed that that thinking capacity just kind of move with it and stay with it and you know it's like everything has to be i mean you know like we th need to think we know what's going on we think we need to think we know where we're going and all that stuff but in truth we don't know anything you know? Yeah. And what about, here's another funny one that people say that you shouldn't talk about it. And this is a funny thing that happened to <laughs> the PM movement that amuses me because they've been listening to Maharishi for decades and everything that they say starts with Maharishi says, <laughs> it's like a sort of Simon Says game. And he talked about it the whole time, but of course you're not allowed to talk about it. If this ever happens to you, people within the same movement actually get rather aggressive 
you know i've seen it happen where people have had some kind of awakening and and people get aggressive towards them that couldn't possibly have happened to you you haven't done enough meditation mm-hmm. you haven't done this you haven't done that you know i don't know if you've heard of roger linden but he's uh, mm-hmm. he used to run the the tm movement up here i'm still in the same town i don't have much to do with it you know it's like a a sort of mini version of Fairfield where Rick lives in the States, which is all the TM crowd, mm. you know, and, and, and with that happened with him, he's a wonderful guy. And now he's, he goes and holds these meetings and whatever, and chats to people down South in London, the people up here, are, Oh no, Roger Linden, that could never have happened to him. <laughs> like, it's mm. so strange. You think, well, you know, this is something that you're desiring more than anything that happens to you. All your friends are going to turn on you as well. It's, this is a very weird thing to me in the whole spiritual community. What do you think about that? There's a there's a story that I love about the sixth Zen patriarch. You know, there was this in India. There's all these different castes, and this guy happened to be from the lowest caste. And then, and their lives are not really good. They only fit for cleaning the shit, and I mean, they're not allowed to do anything basically. And so he was he was traveling and. Um, there was a ferry and um, there was a smasher with a few of his, uh, the people that were hanging with him on the boat. And as he was speaking to the, these guys, that, that, that young man who, from the lower caste, just, it just pierced his heart. So when they got to the other side of the river, he asked the master, listen, I just want to be serve you in whatever capacity I'm from this cast. I'll clean the stable. I'll do whatever. You know, he he was literally he didn't know how to read or write because you know he was from that cast. So he went to the monastery and he had nothing to do with everybody there. He was just cleaning the, the you know doing the, all the shit work basically. And the master came to the point where he realized he was going to transition. Um, and he, so he asked all these students to write a couple of sentences about their understanding to see who would take his robe and bowl. So everybody was busy with this, and uh, uh, the, the lead guy came up with this thing. He said, uh, every day we clean the mirror of the mind with meditation so that no dust will alight on the mirror and obscure our vi- the vision, you know. And everyone thought, wow, that's so great, man. This guy is definitely the next guy. And this guy, you know, not having much to do, he didn't hear about it until uh, the night before the master was going to leave the next day. And so he went to the master's room after his work and he said, listen, master, I can't read or write, but if you tell me, you know, the best one that you've heard so far, I'll give you my response. And so the master said, yeah, every day we clean the mirror of the mind with meditation so that no dust will alight and went to obscure the view and he said oh that's so simple no mind no mirror no dust (laughs) (laughs) the master said well you're the only one that's really seen it here's my robe and bowl but you have to leave this tonight and flee because when they find out they're going to chase you and want to kill you and so he took the robe and bowl and he split and it was true the next morning the people heard what had happened and they started chasing him and it took them some while and they finally caught up with him and um, they wanted to kill him. And he said, look, take this robe and this bowl because it's nothing to me. You know, what I've got, what I've received from the master is way, way much more value. These, this robe and bowl has no value to me whatsoever. And then they recognized and uh, he became the sixth in patriarch and uh, yeah, but you know, for, he, he took years before he started being available to people, just because you know, for him, it he just let it deepen. And but it's a beautiful story. I just uh, you know, because it is so simple and say in a certain sense, no mind, no mirror, no us, You know, but it's like <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> that is cool. yeah, what a day. yeah. I but yeah, that's also that's just this just, just describing how these people then wanted to kill him. <laughs> they, you know, and you understand it's like all the years of practice and meditating, and there's this guy that's been cleaning the shit they just saw. <laughs> you know what, Isaac? I think that's just perfect. I, I can't, I, 
you know, that's a perfect moment to wrap it up on because I just love that story. Mm -hmm. I want people to remember that one because I think you've just encapsulated it there. <clears throat> Fantastic. Isaac Shapiro. Well, thanks for inviting me. Big love, man. You too, man. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for what you're doing, being brave and whatever, because it's a, it's a difficult thing to do sometimes in this. Well, it's difficult and yet it's impossible to resist, eh? Once you've seen it. Oh, it's, it's so much fun. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Uh, you know it's a tragic there's so many tragic times but the the boys you know the the red pill guys the human unleashed guys who i i, I work with a lot we do say that it, it has just been a magical time for for so many things and jeremy Ayers, my friend he always says it's the virus that keeps on giving <laughs> <laughs> i love it <laughs> it's it so just beautiful things that are coming out of it but anyway isaac thank you so much We'll chat again and yeah. that was wonderful thank you so much yeah yeah thanks and uh yeah if you want to if you want to do a live one just let me know i'd love it and love to play so that'll be fun wouldn't it that'll be cool so I, yeah. i'll put your details yeah. down below so people can find and uh have a look in the notes there so cool. see you next episode everybody Peace. yeah <laughs>